Uh, so I have the pleasure to introduce Mr. Chu, who received his bachelor degree in science from Harvey Mudd and his master's degree in EECS here at Berkeley. Um, he is an expert in satellite monitoring and interface mitigation technology, having co-invented and managed the first generation of such systems for the United States government. He founded Glowlink Communications Technology in January 2000 and is now running the company as CEO with around 100 employees. Glowlink has many successful milestones, first receiving contracts from the U.S. government and then many more from the commercial market that led to multiple U.S. patents in the satellite interference arena. Please give a warm welcome to Chef Chu. Everyone, I've asked um, Mr. Chu if he would sit up on the stage because while I'll ask him some questions, I really wanted you all to think about um, questions and asking him as well. Because what can be more interesting than satellites and interference? It sounds like spy stuff. So I thought that would be kind of fun. <laughs> right. So Jeff, I'm wondering, um, I mean, yes, you're up there on the stage. But uh, I think you started, I, I don't know if Satarja, uh, or excuse me, if Bechtel was built. But I think you started here pretty much in the seats of the students. And I was wondering if you could. Tell us a little bit about starting and who some of your colleagues were as you started and kind of how you took your first steps into what you're doing now. Well, first of all, <clears throat> when I came here at, at a long time ago, I didn't feel that there's enough land to put anything else on it. I'm just stunned by the staggering amount of new buildings every time I come through. Um, so. Full disclosure, right? First of all, uh, I'm a native of Hong Kong, so I do have accent in my English. So it's not my first language. If you see anything that's not clear, raise your hand and ask me. I will repeat it for you, OK? Um, you're going to have to write things down, so I'll make sure that you hear what I'm saying. Um, second is um, Vicky asked me how I ended up here at Berkeley. Um, Actually, I didn't. Um, I, uh, after I finished my Harvey Mudd uh, undergrad, I decided to, first of all, I only want to go to grad school in California. And so I went through uh, Caltech, which is right next to Harvey Mudd. And it looked too much like Harvey Mudd. Okay? And then I went to Stanford, and I said, wow, this is really nice. You know, all the lawns are mowed. You know, big spaces, really wonderful. And I went through the cafeteria, it's really nice, nicely done. And then I came up to Berkeley, and first of all, it's just different, okay? <laughs> when I was here, I don't know whether it's still the case, when I was here, there are as many dogs running around <laughs> as there are students, okay? <laughs> and so I said, well, this is different. So I came out uh, the gate, I walked down, of course, Telegraph, right, of all places. And you got to remember, I'm, I'm from Hong Kong, right, OK? And, and I've spent four years at Harvey Mudd. And I'll tell you a little bit about my experiences at Harvey Mudd as well, because I think it's, I can't tell you too much about the skills you need to be a CEO, but I can tell you my personal story and let you draw some conclusion. Hopefully, there's some meaningful conclusion for you to draw. But anyway, I was walking down Telegraph. I'm just looking around, see what's going on. You know, I'm a big city rat. This doesn't face me at all. You know. And then some guy grabbed me. <laughs> and it's a long-haired guy with a lot of beard. I just remember him. He said, young man, I got to teach you the philosophy of life. <laughs> and I said, OK, I think I'm coming here. <laughs> so, so I ended up coming here. And um, I went to EEX. I was very lucky. I got a university fellowship, so I didn't have to work. Uh, I spent all my time studying. And, and at Harvey Mudd, as probably some of you, when you went through applying college here in California, it's a fairly general engineering. So I felt very much I need the rigor. So that's when I ended up at Berkeley. And uh, when I was here, um, I uh, worked uh, under uh, Professor uh, David Messerschmidt. I don't know whether you all have been too young to remember him, but he was an assistant professor, didn't have much research grants and so on, so I'm a freebie to him. So I worked underneath him very lucky because he taught me everything about what I needed to know. 
in digital communications, you know, adaptive signal processing, adaptive equalization, you name it, information theory, Shannon theory, all of those things. All wonderful stuff, exactly what I needed. And, and in, in those years, uh, I was doing one of the areas I was studying was, was stochastic processes in terms of speech synthesis and analysis. And as you know, there's highly non-stationary, all of those wonderful things. And for those of you who are not engineering-oriented, non-stationary means they're impossible to pro There's no average, there's no variance, and so on and so forth. So about 20 milliseconds. So it's very computational intensive. So I was writing some of the earlier C code, okay? That was really cool stuff in those days, okay? And some, some Fortran along the way. And we all have huge punch cards. We go down to the basement or Evans to run the, our program. But anyway, I needed. So, so um, just, I mean, like I know what Fortran is, and I don't know what a lot of other stuff is, but just, you know, it's early computer. Early I'm just, computer. I'm assuming right, everybody right. might know right. what that is. Di dinosaur age computer it is. stuff. So. And a punch card, embarrassing to Yeah, mention, embarrassing. But, but you drop them on the floor, that's even more embarrassing <laughs> because you pick them up together. So, anyway, I was writing that, and, and I needed an operating system to run on. And, Linux, or Unix at the time didn't exist, and some of you know Unix 5 was invented at Berkeley. And the guy who wrote that, or part of the team that wrote that, was Eric Schmidt. Okay? So maybe so, you've heard of Eric Schmidt now? Chairman of Google, right? right? And so, uh, so he was actually the same year, uh, Harvey, uh, uh, at the at X, uh, same, uh, enter uh, uh, Berkeley at the same year. And, I remember I was always looking around for where is Eric with the operating system, right? And it was never around. So a few years ago, I met up with him. I said, um, you know, when, when we were working in an electronic research lab, I don't know whether that still exists or not at Cal, but uh, you were smart, but not that smart. You don't work too hard, you know? How did you become a billionaire? And he said, well, yeah, you, remember you asked me some Monday morning where was the operating system that you asked me for for Friday? I said, I don't remember that at all. I said, this guy is smart. Right? <laughs> and, and he said, you know, you asked me where is my operating system on a Friday. And Monday morning you chew me out where is the operating system. He said, Jeffrey, yes, remember what I said? I said, no, I don't know. And he said, well, yesterday was Sunday. The day before that was Saturday. What do you think I was doing? I said, okay, I get it. Finally, the balance of work and life is exceedingly important. It's something I didn't realize, okay? So that's him. And the other classmate I was very fortunate to work with at the time, although I don't know why the guy even needed a PhD, <laughs> and that's Dean Sestri. Shenka was another classmate. Okay, he's got all the PhDs that needed to be had at Berkeley. So, uh, so those are the people that I, I, I met. Um, so anyway, I left early uh, and I decided that, you know, at one point I was thinking about academia and then I said, well, maybe something else different, you know. So, um, so I left and shortly I left Berkeley, I joined a startup company. And, um, so I, I am curious, like there weren't that many startup companies. I mean, you could have gone to McDonald's franchise. That was a startup company. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of how? Or did Kentucky you Fried Chicken. Huh? Or yep. Kentucky Fried Chicken. Right. There just weren't. I mean, how did this opportunity even come about? Well, it was kind of interesting. Um, there's another university in the Bay Area, big name university, right? And two two <laughs> students from right Stanford, right? And came up with this big idea about doing these things, and they applied for a grant with the Department of Defense, and they got a couple of million. And <laughs> so they said, okay, now what do we do? They said, well, we better go up to Berkeley, find somebody that can actually get the thing done. <laughs> well, they found me, right? And, and remember, I was in stochastic signal processing and all of those things and stuff. And turns out what they want to do is in satellite, this happened to be in satellite communications. If you ask me how I get into satellite, that's how I got into satellite, okay? 
So the whole idea was measuring signal to noise of all the carriers that the US government had around the world, okay? And, and you don't know this, but spectrum analyzing those that had no digital interface, okay? And it was just completely, they would run three shifts of soldiers, 24 hours a day, a whole week to characterize all the performance of carriers on the satellite. Well, these two guys from Stanford went and said, we can do that in three minutes. Okay, three minutes. Jeff, just curious, how many satellites were there? I mean, I Well, if you figure there's uh, satellites by ITU, um, the regulation has to be separate two degrees apart, okay? So roughly, technically, there's really 150. 350? 180, oh, sorry. 180. 180 around uh, the equatorial orbit. Okay, okay 22,000 miles up in something called the clock orbit. And that's the orbit where satellites, they rotate at the same speed as the Earth. And therefore, they are relatively stationary to the Earth. And therefore, they can be used as communication relays, okay? So these communications go out from, by the way, it only takes three satellites to cover the entire Earth, okay? So you wonder why people have so many satellites, well, but just because they can. Um, and uh, some countries really do not have any satellites. So they, leave, they sell the space to other countries that can afford to launch satellites, so on and so forth. But in any case, so the, the whole idea is to measure the signal-to-noise ratio, which, by the way, for those of you there, not communication engineers. There are only two things you need to worry about in communication. It's the easiest thing in the world to study, the signal and the noise, okay? Once you got that understood, that's all you need to know, truly. Signal, you don't even need signal to- Signal and noise? Signals and noise, that's it, you know? And in particular, actually, you only need to know one thing, which is signal to noise ratio. You only really need, need to know the absolute value. So that's the interesting part of that. So the whole idea was to measure those things and so I got into that, and very quickly they said, oh, this guy knows what's going on, because it turns out you only need to figure out two things, signals and noise. And that's a classic, uh, pardon my, my, my lingo here, uh, jargon here, is called two-parametric linear regression model. Okay, what does that mean? That means if I throw you a whole bunch of junk, you extract out of that two things, okay, signals to noise. So it was relatively simple, so we wrote up all the, all the algorithm and so on, and, and we implemented it on big computers, okay? And that project became very successful, and the company got a huge contract from the Department of Defense, and it went public. So that's when I- Is it a company I've, that we would have heard of? Uh, it no longer existed. Mm -hmm. It got bought out. Uh, it's actually called Stanford Telecommunications. Okay? <laughs> but it was done by a Berkeley guy uh, uh, to make it work. So anyway, um, that was when I had, you know, it, I, I wasn't rich enough to retire. Actually, I could. But the stock options and so on and so forth, that's when I realized how capitalism really works, OK? It really is very nice. And I was your age. and. Uh, you know, in those days we wear jeans to work, and that's considered like the flip flops and the sh shorts of today, right? And so, uh, so from there, um, I, that's how I got uh, involved in the satellite communications. From there, I went to, um, I was recruited to a major company, which I will not name, um, but it was very interesting experience. I was there for five years. I uh, managed an international program. I went to the World Court because the company needed to sue some of the countries around the world. So I was involved with all of those things. And you got to remember, I came from Hong Kong, right? I did, I'm an engineering student from Harvey Mudd and Cal. But I was involved in all of those things. You know, you know how they, um, in some of these World Court, the, the judges really wear the wigs, the really funny looking thing. And, so there was those things, and then uh, from there. So Jeffrey, I'm I'm actually curious. I mean, you're you're an engineer. Yeah. And usually, as an engineer, you're focused on doing your code, doing that. How and why did you get pulled into the courtroom? Uh, I was running an international program, mm -hmm. uh, and what happened was um, it, it has all these consortium supplies around the world, and in those days, the U.S. you know is the prime contractor, so I was the prime contractor. And there's also legal issue contention in some countries in 
never want to pay, and therefore you need to do, go to work court to make them pay. Other countries would say, hey, Jeffrey, would this work? You know, I said, um, no, you need to talk to my lawyers. Um, so it, it, it's a fantastic experience, international exposure. By the way, satellite communication, the moment you are in it, you are international, okay? Because like I said, three satellites cover the entire Earth, right? So your, our customers are all international, global customers. Um, so from there, I went into a, a, a number of, of other, by the way, I got recruited into this, so that you know, I got recruited in this big company because the big company people, the senior executive play poker with the company I help go public on weekends, okay? And apparently my name showed up and so they basically poached, we lost the poker game to you, we're gonna grab one of your guys. <laughs> so, I, so I ended up there uh, and learned just tons of things and, and some of which probably shouldn't go on the air. But, um, but I, I, you know, it, it's a fantastic experience for me in terms of financial control, in terms of how to conduct yourself professionally. Uh, it's a uh, both commercial as well as the department defense type of government type of contracting company. And so it's a great learning experience. And from there, I went into what they call the uh, classified electronics business. And turns out in between those two, uh, my wife, um, who I actually met at the Claremont Colleges, uh, was a physician. And we have our two kids. And between our two kids, she actually took off about 18 months. And she was losing some of the knowledge. So I actually quit my job. And this is pre-paternity days. I quit my job and stay home as a stay home Mom, right? Mr. Mom, before the movie came I, out. I hear it's Mom. called a sad, isn't that terrible? Stay well, at home, dad, sad. <laughs> sorry, S A H. Thank you, yeah, that was good. Sure, sorry. <laughs> so I actually took all 18 months and it was probably the best 18 months I've ever had as a person because I realized how much work mom had to do. And I would take my our kids to play group and I would try to interact with other moms I was the only guy, by the way. And, uh, and they don't really, they don't know how to, how to take me, you know, how to see me. It's just say, okay, this guy doesn't work, he's probably lazy, you know. Um, so, so I, and then one day I ran into uh, a, a, the wife of a friend of mine. And I said, hey, where's, what's, you know, because the last name is quite unusual. It's Italian name, last name. Said, Are you related to Mike? He said, yeah. And I said, how's, how's Mike doing? And she said, he works. <laughs> and I said, oh, I know my place now. So, um, so I actually spent 18 wonderful months with my kids. So when I came out, by the way, when I quit, I was a director at this company, big company. Okay, when I quit, I said, boss, you know, I, I got, this is after running that international program, which by the way, nobody else wanted to touch because it's so hairy. That's why they, well, this guy probably doesn't know what's going on at the time. And, and actually the program, I turned the program around. It was hard work, it was very interesting, lots of experiences. So when I quit the job, my boss actually said, what happened to you, you had a lobotomy? You know lobotomy? You know, no, he said, you know, you walk away from that, you are HPI, right? high potential individual. You walk away from this, and you, we're just going to give, give up on you. Fund, fundamentally, not exactly those words, but close to it. Uh, say, so, okay. So when I came out, I think it was like somewhere in the depressed area. There's really not a whole lot to do. So I start from the bottom. I became an engineer again, okay? and with totally different perspective. So I, I haven't lost my design skills and I very quickly got put in front of customers. And I happened to be thinking that, you know, to do some of these things, some of our guys need to, I can't tell you too much, but some of you guys can get in and get out quickly, right? So what do you do? You want to make things easy for people to use. That seems like revolutionary idea. I said, what have you guys been doing? You know, just make it easy, right? So I became very, uh, successful in that, and 
joined the company uh, because the customer told me that's where the contract is going to go, Jeffrey. You need to go there. Right? So I said, OK. Well, I went there, and sure enough, it's, it's a very small world. Uh, and I ended up there. And now this brings us to around the end of the Clinton era, okay? the President Clinton. The first, uh, you mean the first president? The first Clinton, Clinton no, Bill Clinton. Right? And during the eight years of his presidency, he cut quite a bit of defense spending. And I was with this company who is who only knows sole source business, meaning no competition, and who only knows there's a government contracting scheme called cost plus fixed fee, CPFF. And that is the way the government will contract with some high risk programs and say, if you run out of money, I'll write, give you more money, okay? It's a very nice business, right? And it's so comfortable that people just eventually got, well, just got lazy about it, right? So, but with this defense spending cutting, everybody in Silicon Valley across the country say we need to diversify. The Lockheed Martin, the GD, everybody um, try to diversify. So this company wanted to diversify. So I was running a, by this time I was running a small business area for them. And I said, okay, well let's go diversify. So we went out and bid a completely 100% commercial job, right? And lo and behold, it's highly competitive. Nobody ever heard about this company. If I told you, you wouldn't know it either because it doesn't exist anymore. But anyway, the, the, the small company, um, we went out and lo and behold, we won the bid. We, we wrote fantastic proposals. That's one of the things, skill you must have. Can you talk I'll, about, this was a commercial bid, are you allowed to say what you bid on? Uh, yes, uh, it's actually bidding for, at the time, the only US satellite company called Pan Amsat, okay, which again no longer existed. It got swallowed up by another company called International uh, Intelsat, which is the world's largest satellite company now. Uh, so we went out to bid this satellite communication contract. And again, the job is to do satellite monitoring. Right? So we wrote a very good proposal. By the way, that's one of the skills you must have, which is good writing skills, okay? Um, so we, we won it, and the day we won it, the president said, hey, Jeffrey, I need you to come down to my office. I said, great, okay, well, I'm gonna get a, you know, a bonus, whatever, a boy, whatever. So I went down there, and he said, what's this? Firm fixed price? Penalty on late delivery? I said, well, that's reality, right? In the commercial world, your stuff better works, right? You, you go buy an iPhone, you better work. Otherwise, you go to the store and return it. And it turns out the business model is completely not aligned with the real commercial world. Right? So one of my engineers who had taken one business class decided on that weekend to write business plan, <laughs> okay, a five-pager, and Monday he showed me that. And so, by the way, this, this, this company said, get rid of it, you know, get it done, wrap it up, and we never do this again, so. This was so, the first commercial bid that you all bid, won, that they said won. get rid of it. Right, they didn't want it, okay, because it's, it's too much, you know. And we completely understood. So one of my, not in my direction, this engineer took on his own initiative. By the way, there's another thing, which is always pay attention to the most innovative, out of the box thinking guy in your group, because that might just surprise you in a very nice way. So his name is Michael Downey, okay? He's my co-founder of the company. So Michael went home, wrote this business plan, the five pager. The idea was, we understand your business model doesn't fit this kind of business pursuit. How, how about just spin us off, capitalize the company at $1 million, you own 51% of the company, right? You get complete control. If you don't like us, you throw us out. Well, I read the plan and I said, Mike, I didn't know you could do all this stuff. I mean, this is really wonderful stuff. You're an engineer, you know what do you do? Uh, and, and this stuff for, and it's really good. So I forwarded it to the president of the company. And about two weeks later, we got called into his office. 
And it was over lunchtime, and I got chewed out from one side up, the other side down. What are you doing? You're wasting, I told you to wrap this up and throw this out. Now you're doing this stuff, right? And um, you're, you're wasting company resources, and so on and so forth. I'm saying, okay, well, this is nasty. In the meantime, Michael Downey, face is getting redder and redder. He was there with me. And truly, he's gotten the Irish out of him, okay? Uh, Michael Down is three-quarter Irish, I mean, 116 Native American, and a bunch of other things. Uh, he is a former Mr. California 17. So he will work out in places with Arnold Schwarzenegger. He is a bodybuilder, and he happened to be a software engineer. So when he programmed, you can't really see the keyboard <laughs> or the monitor because he's huge. Right? So he didn't react. He, his face was getting red, and uh, I've seen things. And so we walked out. And this building, this company is not a huge company. Okay? It's got a building and it's a parking lot. We took one walk around the parking lot. And that's how we formed Glowlink. We formed Glowlink because we did not want to walk away from the people who knew nothing about our company and yet have faith and confidence in us being able to build a system for them. So we actually have no market, no business. We formed a company on a sense of commitment. Okay. And Michael and I were very different. I'm a big city rat, right? I grew up in Hong Kong. I don't know how many people have been, or some of you are from Hong Kong, right? You've been there in Hong Kong. And Michael Downey got his education in a one school, one room school in the Sierras. And that school has all the way from first grade to 12th grade. There's one teacher in it, one principal, one janitor, one administrator, and that's all one person, and that's Michael Downey's mom, okay? So he came down and went to Cal State Sacramento, probably one of the most innovative, brilliant people you've ever met, I've ever met. And that's how Glowling was formed. We formed Glowling with no investors, no business plan, other than Michael spin us off for $1 million or something. And we only have a sense of commitment so we formed Golang. Several things happened in the first four weeks. Okay, if you guys ever want to say, hey, I want to, whatever reason I want to form a company, be ready for surprises, right? So in the first four weeks, uh, an existing company in Silicon Valley called us up and said, hey, guys, we heard you guys form a company. Yeah, we did. It's a very small community, by the way, satellite communication. It's a billion dollar industry, but it's small. He said, I want you to buy us. Huh? Really? We don't have any business. We don't know anything about, about buying anybody. No, don't worry about it. Just buy us. We got financing arranged, $7 million for investors in, in San Francisco, and just buy us. And so we looked at it and said, well, we, we, we don't know. We're a bunch of engineers. We don't know how to do this stuff. Right? So, so we didn't buy them. And the second thing that happened was, in two, and, and two weeks after we formed the company, we called up Pan Amsat and we said, hey, we, we left the company because we felt we need to support you. And they said, uh, uh, you know, thank you. We heard that, and we really admire what you guys do. We really appreciated it. But your your former president came down and and committed to the business. He actually is going to spin off a company and fund it with ten million dollars. Uh huh. What well, we asked for one million here, so we couldn't figure out exactly what's going on there, other than um, the the. People later on told us, they said, well, you know, these two guys, they're kind of crazy, but they're not stupid. They're probably a huge part of gold at the end of that, and we better get into it, okay? Um, so, so this company, Pan Am, says, hey, we really appreciate what you did, but we can't give you the business, for very understandable reasons, right? So we have no business. Glowlink was formed in January, on January 7, 2000. If you all 
recall you probably, some of you are probably in grade school at the time. That's when the dot com busted. Right? The economy dived. Absolutely nothing. That was okay. Right? Michael Downey has got three kids. His youngest kid was six months old. When we formed the company, we specifically said, "Are you are you crazy? You know, I'm okay, but but you know, if Cindy doesn't work, and you know, he says, no, we got to do what we do. Well, we're very different, but we share one thing, which is we do what we say we're going to do. Okay, and if there's something about Glowing, that's what Glowing is all about. Okay, so we've been around for 16 years now. And so after we've done that, there's, there's no business. And then, as Travis said, during that period of time, I got a call from the Department of Defense and says, hey, Jeffrey, we heard you form a company. I said, oh, yeah, we did. What took you so long? I, I don't know, we're engineers. So our first contract as a commercial company is actually a Department of Defense government contract. And that's how Golden got started. Uh, the other thing that got started was... So just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. because you're talking about Department of Defense uh, uh, contracts and how they usually worked. Right. Based on what you saw previously and didn't like, was there anything different that you negotiated for this contract or that the Department of Defense negotiated with you all? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. We, we are actually now into that stage. But throughout our projects with the Department of Defense, they always, they've always bought it through the companies, you know, some other companies. So we always channel our products through because we're a commercially structured company. And um, so because of that, we move our products and services through some other intermediate that the stands in front of the, the government. So that's how we started uh, Glowlink. And then uh, three years later, needless to say, there's another story is these guys don't know what they're talking about. They spun off company. They really don't know what they're doing. So they flame out, right? They collapsed. Uh, actually, a few years later, the president of the company got taken out because of the huge investment they made. I got no, nothing to show for. So that's another lesson learned is for what we do, it always helps to know something about what you're doing. So three years later, that company, came, Pan Amsa, came back to us, and we built a global 27 sites around the world satellite monitoring system for them. Okay? Um, less important, let me just tell you uh, in, in quick few sentences what we do. We build digital signal processing systems that monitor satellite traffic. Okay, not the content, but the signal to noise ratio. So what does that mean? That means our customers, um, some of which I can actually name, uh, Disney, so all of the ESPN channels you watch, our system monitor them real time. And what happened is, um, satellites are very susceptible to, for, to interference and in rain phase. You know, there's a rain cloud coming through, a storm coming through, it will knock the signal out. Right? So very important for them to monitor the signal-to-noise ratio. Okay? Um, so there will be managers that will be using our system, and if something happens, before you says no signal available, they will switch the channel without you knowing it. You will still be tuned to ESPN2 or whatever but they will be switching the frequency of transmission to maintain the broadcast. So they are customers, um, and some other customers are uh, you know, the weather satellites. So NOAA is our customer. So our system monitor weather pictures, all the pictures you see at night, we actually monitor them to make sure the signal to noise ratio is there so the picture is clear. Uh, NPR, our favorite, uh, National Public Radio, they, they have broadcast stations around the world, uh, I mean around the country, uh, the FAA, um, they use our systems, monitor all the pilot to ground transmissions uh, coming through Asia Pacific. Okay. So those are some of the customers that we have, and that's what we do as, as a company. We also, uh, from spectrum monitoring, signal processing, we also moved to something called geolocation. Because of interference, this happened quite frequently on satellite. First, you monitor and detect it, and once you monitor, you find something, I got an interference here that's not supposed to be here. You like to know where it comes from. So hopefully you can call somebody and 
fly over to find a dish, right? And contact somebody, hey, you're transmitting at the wrong frequencies. So that's called geolocation. It's really triangulation with two satellites 22,000 miles up, okay, to find out where the location is. So the, that's another line of product we have. And then we also have a line of product that actually does satellite frequency planning. So you properly plan your frequency transmission where you point, so you don't inadvertently interfere with somebody else, okay? So the, we have those three technology and product lines going. And the fourth one, which is more of a newer one, is we, about three and a half years ago, we stumbled upon this idea. And it's no different than you guys, you know, chatting in the hallway and so on, say, hey, you know, we, we got detection of interferences, which is monitoring. We got um, geolocation, which is finding where the sources of interference come from. We can plan things. Well, you can do all those things. Guess what? There are circumstances where people just say, hey, it's not me. I didn't interfere with you. And your traffic is still suffering, right? Because it got interfered with. So we said, why don't we just take them out? So what do you mean? That? Oh, by the way, this is Michael's idea. Why don't we just take him out? He said, well, here's Terminator talking again. He said, how do you do that? Well, turns out we went back to what we've done from our roots, which is signal processing. And you just do it adaptively. And the math isn't that, that complicated. The theory isn't that complicated. The algorithm isn't that complicated. It's fairly computational intensive. So those of you who are in communication signal processing, there's a lot of stuff to be had there, OK? And, and the world's gone wireless. There are lots of things happening. So use your skills there. Uh, so what we did was we said, OK, why don't we invent something that kind of is like a vacuum machine, vacuum up the interferences before the receiver sees it. I said, OK, what's the big deal? The big deal is in order to do that, you have to be able to do it without knowing anything about the interferences, OK? So that's only useful, right? Okay. And it turns out it took us probably uh, a year or so to get all the algorithm, check it out on MATLAB, you know, everything. Uh, and it all worked fine. The, the only problem is it's so computational intensive, you can make it real-time streaming. So we spent the next two and a half years on making it real-time streaming. So it's actually a technology now we have we built some show products around it that people can literally take to, to a satellite ground station and put it in front of a modem, right? A, a receiver and for it to clean the signals out. But we've gone down efficiently enough, it can actually fit on a chip. You know, your snap, uh, 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 Snapdragon, right? 10 million, 10 million gates on it. Our processing is half a million gates, okay? So, um, so right now, we are at a point we really don't know how big this thing is. Okay? So that's really bringing us up today in terms of market application. What we see is it can go into your smartphone, which, as you all know, is a magnet for interferences. Okay? Uh, it can go into TV set-top boxes. And it's, it's hardware and software. Uh, it, it's both. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's more what they call VHDL core. Okay, mm -hmm. which is the, the, the jargon they use for a computer chip. Yep. ASIC, application specific ASIC. So it can be on that. Uh, it can go on into the ground equipment. It can go inside a modem, a receiver, or it can be outboard to a receiver. It can go into spacecraft. Uh, you all know some of you who are in electrical engineering, FPGA, right? So FPGA, we can put it on satellite. So really don't know how big and how far this thing can go, and we are right in the middle of it. So, so, right. so you have this incredible, something that could be, it could be revolutionary. Yes. What do you do with it? What do you do, do you approach other people? I'm like, what, what we, now? Uh, we, we actually been approached by others, you know, and, and we haven't gone out really to uh, evangelize this thing. The people have come to us, because we showed them some stuff. And obviously, the largest uh, interest of the customer is our own government, right? Because this thing has application across the board. And it turns out what we do when we remove the interference that's inside a signal, we actually preserve the fidelity of that. We actually preserve the signal to noise ratio of the thing we remove. We just doesn't suck it up and throw it away, okay? 
So it actually is a signal separation thing. So immediately you can tell why broadcasters are interested because they can stack two channels, one on top of the other. At the other end, they just separate them, right? Which means you only need to lease half of the bandwidth that you normally use. And that's big bucks, OK? Uh, satellite transponder for a year, uh, uh, 36 megahertz for a year is about $3 million, right? So, uh, so very expensive bandwidth. Um, so that's really bring us to where we are today, OK? So how, do, how am I doing in time? You're doing I'm, okay. I'm, We're probably at a place where people, if they have questions, feel can free to, to ask some questions. Feel free to ask any questions you want. But I just want to uh, cover several things. One is that if you summarize what we did, we're probably very lucky. Okay, very lucky. Uh, we're all, always um, grateful for that, being at the right place at the right time with the right things. The other thing is, the, the element of commitment and trust. Um, we have very, very long-term customers. The Glowlink is about 16 years old. So we are into what we call Glowlink 2.0 now uh, with this new technology. Okay, so learning from all the things we learned in the past. Uh, those are the things we do. Um, we, we always felt that you can never be wrong doing the right thing. So we always do the right thing. And we were. Sounds like your Google before Google was Google. Sorry? Sounds like your Google before Google. You know what Google don't do. Oh, yeah. right, yeah. Is well, that what they said? Oh. Kind of. Oh, sort okay. of. Never mind. So, Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> okay, hopefully nobody copyrighted that name. We erased from the tape. Uh, but we, you, know, you, you just felt a sense of, um, you just feel good about doing some of these things, you know, and, and, and living up to your commitment. It's, it's, Easier said than done. There's a lot of hard work. Um, sometimes, especially in my position, being CEO is really, you know, which side do you stand? And I almost always go back to the roots, where I came from, where I'm now. Uh, being so lucky in a place. And those things really matter. In, in a more of a mindset issue, uh, you know, how you form a company run. Uh, my favorite thing is when I leave work, usually quite late at night, um, it's not just you know the uh, under 100 people company uh, that we have. It's really about 100 families, and that really you know filters into across our vendors, our partners, and our customers. People put faith in us when they sign up a major contract. By the way, our equipment are all very expensive, so so that's really some of the underpinnings. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and. Feel free to ask any questions. All right. Any? Giving you my well, thank you. I, I know how busy you all are. My son graduated from EECS here, too. Okay? <laughs> and, and he worked for two years at Qualcomm. Now he's working at Golink because of this new technology. He's just joined us last July. And so I know all you, you guys all work extremely hard at, at Berkeley. And, one thing about Berkeley and some of the other places I'm aware of is you get to stand on your own two feet here. Nobody is going to cocoon you, okay? Babysit you. And I tell you, for the rest of your life, that's the best experience you will ever have. Never feel you're entitled. Never feel that you need somebody to help you. Stand on your own two feet. I've been told the same thing many times over. Because when Glowing was formed, we could sign on something called 8A, set aside, disadvantage, and so on, right? because of Michael's um, genetic mix and the fact that I'm, I'm a minority or something. But we never did. We just went out and on our own. So something to keep in mind. Okay. Could you say what, y'all are, what you're studying? Oh, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, my name is Hatim Khan. Uh, yes. I'm a third year studying computer science. Mm -hmm. uh, so you mentioned using those chips to send like two streams of data um, with the inference chips. Say that again. You mentioned uh, like using those chips to be able to send like kind of two sets of data using only like half the bandwidth um, right. with those inference chips. So could that be used to like, speed up download time and cut that by half? Excellent question. Yes, uh, you can because of the fact that we can we can remove from the noise part you actually can increase the capacity in many ways, right? 
so you can inc increase your data throughput because it's all about app node, right? EB energy per bit over noise density. By the way, all that means is if I get more power to a bit, it's likely going to blast through all the noise and I get to receive it properly. Okay, that, so yes, it, it can actually increase the data throughput. Okay. In a way, if you project that forward, that means the wheel spinning on your, on your smartphone should spin less because it's used something called adaptive uh, modulation scheme, meaning that when it sends the signal to noise drop to a certain level, it will drop the data level, data throughput, just to make sure that you have enough energy per bit. Okay. So it will, it will tend to help with that. Yeah. Um, how many people are communication engineer here, electrical? Raise your hand. Only one? OK. Two, maybe? The rest of it will remain anonymous, three? OK. You know, you know how those uh, performance curve, you know, the energy per bit versus error rate? So if you look at a classic receiver or mod modem a performance curve, it goes like this, meaning that as you increase the energy on the x-axis, right? The y-axis, which is a probability of error, will go drop, right? So at some point, if you have enough energy per bit, you pretty much have error-free reception. Well, this technology actually, and a modem is like this. A theoretical limit is like the Shannon theory is like this. Our technology is somewhere in between. And then we are pushing towards the Shannon theory limit. So it's extremely powerful in that sense. Yes. Okay. I have a CS question here. Okay. CS? Yeah, computer science. Um, okay. Do you think you could actually apply this also to wireless charging to be able to send power through? Because you can already send power through wireless. You can send it through as a wireless signal and then take that out as the power, and the rest could be the data. There you go. If you are looking for an internship, give me a call. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I mean, some of the wildest ideas we have at Glowlink, just like that. Can we do that? And somebody says, Jeff, that doesn't sound right at all. You know? And they were right. So one of the big things, one of my biggest enjoyment is telling people how wrong I can be. Really, no kidding. You know? and, and, um, so yeah, it's possible. Okay, thank you. Okay. More brainstorming? There was a question, and I don't know whether the person asked. Yeah, go ahead. How much is the material cost for the, for the 500 gate, uh, 500,000 gate wireless modem? Is it like 500,000? Um, we actually, that's in a bunch of code. So in terms of generating the chip themselves, it can be in the tens or twenty dollars type range each. Yeah, okay. yeah. That, that's, that's the recurring cost, not the initial, you know, Laying out a waiver yeah, and all of that. Uh, I mean, just per product. Yeah, per product. Well, there, there's actually um, some talk about can we get this down to 50 cents? And, and I said, yeah, we license the technology at that, at that price. Because if you talk about 150 million handsets, 50 cents each is adds up, right? Yeah. No. I was just thinking that um, depending on that number, mm -hmm. you could I was just thinking that depending on, on how much that cost is, it would either let you be in wireless, you know, in smartphones or not, or it would let you be in set-top boxes or not, or it would let you, you know, like there's different tiers of the market, so I was right. just wondering how, but I think what you're saying is at FPGA, you can get it at $20 or $10, but if you roll your own, you know, it's not, if you roll your own non-FPGA, it could be like a dollar. Correct, or yeah. less. Less. Yeah. The beauty about this technology is completely scalable. Right now, we put them in a box, we sell them for $200,000, okay, for some very specific yeah. application. So it's completely scalable. That's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Meaning it can fit in something very small, fit into something people can deal with the form factor, with the size of it, right? So. 
Uh, I just want to thank you so much for actually taking something that I don't think anybody really knew or quite understood that much about and bringing it so close to home that everybody kind of, you know, we had a couple of interesting brainstorm ideas. Right. Thank you for taking so much of your time with us. And would you stay with us if we have one-off questions? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time.